I'm going to do the prayer for illumination. Then I'm going to suggest that we stand back together in a moment, and we're going to recite the Ten Commandments together. The words will be up on the screen. Let me get us in prayer. Lord, again, we thank you for your living word. We thank you for the process by which the scriptures have come into our hands. We thank you that we can own copies of the Bible freely here in this country. We pray for those who have to hide Bibles, who are being punished for distributing Bibles. Lord, help us to not let our Bibles collect dust on the shelf. Lord, help us to open them and read them and use them. We thank you for those of us who have family Bibles that are well-thumbed and well-worn. We thank you for those who have gone before us who have read your word and lived it. Lord, this is our time, and I pray, Lord, that you would open your word to us this morning to understand what it is you're saying to us through your spirit. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand, please? The words are up on the screen in front of you. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above, or on the earth beneath, or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days shall you labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your animals, nor the alien within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his manservant, or maidservant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. When the people saw the thunder and lightning, and heard the trumpet, and saw the mountain in smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, Speak to us yourself, and we will listen. But do not have God speak to us, or we will die. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. God has come to test you, so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sin. Amen. You may be seated. Brian is going to come forward now and share our second scripture with us. second scripture is from Matthew 21. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and went away on a journey. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them more than the first time, and the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? He will bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied, and he will rent the vineyard to other tenants will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. 
Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures, The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone? The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce his fruit. He who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom it falls will be crushed. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Great to have you reading scripture with us again, Brian. Thank you. We have one more scripture today. It's time for the glasses. This is from Philippians chapter 3. If anyone thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. In regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for legalistic righteousness, faultless. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God is by, and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. And so, somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this, or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which Jesus, or which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Well, as some of you know, I've always tried to remain in relationship with my non-church friends over the years. Last Monday, I was down in New Jersey seeing an old buddy of mine, that's Jeff Pivar on your left. Uh, he, was in a, he and I were in a band together back in 1978. We've been friends all these years. Jeff has been playing with David Crosby up there for about 25 years now. Of course, that's Crosby from Crosby, Stills, and Nash. Um, I've had a chance to meet Crosby and Nash many times over the years, hung out with them in the studio and in their tour buses. David Crosby's noted for his left-leaning politics, which he shares readily from the microphone, and he's noted for having a very strong personality. Most of his old friends and bandmates uh, have gotten offended one way or another, don't speak to him anymore. But anyway, I was hanging out with the band uh, on their tour bus after the show last Monday, and I had a chance to talk with Crosby, and we were talking about the fact that I'm a Presbyterian minister, and Jeff was telling him about our church. I had told Jeff that we are striving to get outside of our walls and help people who aren't <coughs> members of our church. I talked about the Grace House that we're getting involved with, and the Love Your City program, all that. So David Crosby said, well, you know, I don't usually think too highly of clergy types. Most of them are full of a lot of hot air. He, that wasn't quite the term he used, but. Um, <laughs> but I, he said, I like this idea of you guys serving the poor. That's kind of like your guy Jesus did. So I can support that. And with that, I suppose I was given the right to continue to talk to him. And we talked another half hour or so. Um, but I thought to myself, hmm. Having an outward focus and a willingness to serve others humbly can maybe be a witness to non-believers, at least a means of having some conversation. If I had started uh, our conversation by pointing out that he's a sinner heading straight to hell, we might not have had a very long discussion. <laughs> Basically, I came away from this time with all these musicians last week thinking that um, they all have the mistaken 
idea that since they're basically good people, they'll be in heaven when they die. That was pretty much the theme of all these conversations I had. Of course, those of us who have read the scriptures and believe the truth of the Bible, we know that that is not true. But we can't start conversations with this fact. We have to establish some kind of common ground or agreement with people and then move carefully and sensitively into deeper spiritual truths. So I didn't have the opportunity to pray the sinner's prayer with David Crosby, but I think if, I, if we got him to ponder even for a minute that maybe all preachers aren't his enemies, there might be something to this message that the church preaches. Maybe I planted a seed, who knows? He is 77 years old and he's had a replacement kidney for 20 years, so he's not gonna be around forever. And maybe in his last hospital stay before he takes his last breath, maybe he will seek the Lord. I can only pray that. But you know this falsehood that basically good people will be rewarded in heaven for their mostly good deeds, that is the most insidious lie that the devil has foisted on this world. We gotta be on the lookout for any whiff of this as we talk with people and we gotta be ready as the Spirit leads to counter that with the truth of the gospel. You know, if you wanna know if you are good enough on your own merits to earn your way to heaven, just read the Ten Commandments as we just did uh, and you're gonna realize that you are a sinner saved only by God's grace. If that doesn't do the trick, read over the list of the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians 5 and see how many of those you consistently demonstrated throughout each day. The Bible says that we all sin and have fallen short of the glory of God. That's what we know in the church. Now the ancient Hebrews used uh, the Ten Commandments all the time in their worship. We don't get around to reading them that often in our services. I do like to bring them out every now and then and review them in worship as we have just done. The first century Pharisees that Jesus was always sparring with absolutely had heard these commandments read aloud in their entirety over and over again throughout their lives. They heard these commandments read in the Holy Temple in Jerusalem. They knew the law of God. And as far as they knew, they believed that they were obeying it down to the finest detail. Their teachers had made them memorize these Ten Commandments of God from their youth, and since they thought they knew the law so well, Jesus, presumptuous at lecturing them about it, just made their blood boil. How dare this self-ordained preacher with his bunch of unemployed followers presume to tell us anything about our religion? And what was that story he just told anyway? Is he accusing us of murdering somebody? The nerve, as if we didn't know the law. We're the ones who have obviously been blessed by God. Look at the respect the crowd has for us. Look at our fine clothes and the wealth that God has blessed us with. And then look at him. Somebody ought to do something about this guy. It's an outrage. The Bible says when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. These Pharisees knew the law. They knew it said, thou shalt not kill, but he made them so mad and threatened their standing with the people so much that they began to try to figure out ways to kill him anyway. Here they were plotting to break one of the Ten Commandments and kill somebody for telling them that they're not righteous. They probably said to themselves, hey, we're good people. Just ask anybody. You might remember in this news story from a few years ago, uh, there were a couple of teenagers from Miami that were bored one afternoon. So they borrowed their parents' Mercedes and they went down to a black neighborhood and they began firing a gun that shot six-inch darts at elderly passers-by. Of course, they were quickly stopped and arrested, but the parents, when they got down to the police station, began chewing out the police for arresting their boys saying, these are basically good kids. Basically good kids, except they wounded a dozen people with six-inch darts. I saw another instance of parents weeping on the TV news. They were protesting that their sons were really good kids, even though they had just been arrested for hijacking a car with a baby in the backseat and leaving the car with the baby in it all alone. We admit what they did was wrong, cried the mom, but they're not bad kids. 
okay? <laughs> My point in all of this is that I am sure the Pharisees thought that they were basically good people. They believed that they were following God's laws as well as they could. And yet, here they were doing precisely what Jesus was talking about in his parable. They were plotting to kill him as the ancestors had done to the prophets before him. They just could not see themselves the way Jesus did or the way a righteous God did. Instead of falling on their knees and begging for forgiveness for their proud, sinful attitudes, they stood there smugly and began to plot to have him arrested, which of course meant they knew it meant that he would be killed. I'm afraid that we can read a parable like this and say, yeah, boy, those Pharisees were sure bad guys. And here Jesus is standing right in front of them. Instead of believing in him, they decide to kill him. And we may feel morally superior to these Pharisees. We could say to ourselves, well, we're clearly not as bad as those guys. But think about why Jesus had to die in the first place. It was because of human sin, because of your sin and my sin. Because we have sinned and continue to sin, Jesus had to die according to God's eternal plan. It's up to each one of us to listen to the message of the prophets and to listen to the message of Jesus himself and repent over and over again as necessary with hearts full of gratitude. If people persist in thinking that they're basically good people, they deny that they're actually sinners in need of a savior. If they're basically good people and they get into heaven on that basis, then Jesus didn't have to die to pay for their sin. That would mean that he died for nothing, right? Now these Pharisees were obviously spiritually blind. They didn't see themselves in Jesus' parable about him at first. And we must not make the same mistake. When we continue to sin, even after we've given our lives to Christ, we're as bad as those who threw out the messengers and stoned them or put the landowner's son to death. So the proper response to this parable this morning is not to say, oh yeah, those are bad Pharisees. It should be, dear Lord, forgive me for rejecting your message in small ways. Really, for most of us, our moral choices are small ones on a day-to-day -day basis. The great Christian writer G.K. Chesterton uh, referred to our sins as tremendous trifles. He said, life doesn't usually present us with big temptations to grandiose sins. Instead, he said, we constantly encounter little temptations that easily slip under the threshold of our levels of tolerance. These little, apparently insignificant temptations nibble away at us, gradually com compromising our integrity with each tiny bite. Isn't that about right? Paul, in our passage from Philippians, talked about straining forward to what lies ahead and pressing on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call. And this imagery kind of implies that we're slogging against great resistance, and that is what it's like a lot of the time. A step at a time, uphill, until we run the entire race. We do have the Ten Commandments and the rest of the Bible as a guide. And as Christians, we try to follow these things and occasionally we fail. But the idea is that we increasingly grow like Christ as we get more experienced in the Christian life. This is called the process of sanctification. God's ways begin to make more and more sense to us the longer that we follow. I get alarmed when I realize that the society out there really doesn't know or care much about God's laws or His ways. These kids that do these horrendous things like shoot people each for their, get to get their basketball jacket or the parents that torture a child in the closet for years. The Sunnis and the Shiites that massacre each other all the time. There's so many people that don't seem to even have a clue that there's anything wrong with their behavior. That's kind of scary. In the old days when my parents were kids, at least in this country, it seemed like everybody in society at least knew what the Ten Commandments were. Nowadays, I would guess that it would be statistically rare to find ten people in one afternoon who could name all ten of the commandments. So what does this mean to us? Well, I would say that we have an important job 
to share the truth of the gospel with people in whatever appropriate conversations we find ourselves in. The truth of the gospel that people are lost in their sin and they won't make it to heaven on the basis of their supposed good works. This is crucial for every person in the world to know. But there's more than just the Ten Commandments that will convince them of this truth. The Pharisees had the commandments, but according to Jesus, they still missed the whole point because they didn't understand the heart of God. They didn't understand His love and grace. The Apostle Paul was a Pharisee. He said that in our passage. He'd been trained since his youth to be able to recite the commands of God. But it was only after his encounter with Jesus Christ that the law began to make sense. He said, again in the book of Philippians, whatever gains I had, I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. The Ten Commandments by themselves were just a bunch of rules that were too hard to follow. Paul came to understand that once he knew Christ, he wanted to be like him, to please his Savior with his behavior. He said, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ. So we have got to try to help our world understand this. It's the message of life. It's the only thing that really makes any sense in this crazy world. We don't earn our salvation by our righteous behavior because none of us is consistently righteous. Anybody want to claim that they're always righteous? I don't think so. Our salvation comes to us as a result of the grace of God and through our faith in the cross. And then we try to follow the law as a response to this grace, not as a means of earning it. Very important point. The Pharisees needed this message as much as the poor people out of the street that also heard Jesus preaching. But the Pharisees' pride kept them from hearing it and understanding it. But Jesus preached it anyway. And some of the Pharisees, like Nicodemus, understood, as did many of the other folks at all the levels of society, there is a spiritual power in the truth that cuts through. We can rely on that. There was a new missionary in China 120 years ago, and when he got there, uh, the retiring missionary pulled him aside and said, you know, don't start in using the name of Jesus right away in your preaching, because these Confucian scholars have got the people all stirred up about that name. So concentrate on getting them to demolish their false gods. And then maybe later, when you've got their confidence, perhaps then you can mention Jesus. Well, this advice kind of troubled the new missionary, but he kept it in mind. And his first year wasn't that fruitful. So he decided to throw out the advice of that old discouraged missionary, and he started preaching about Jesus Christ boldly. He contrasted Jesus' ways with the ways of the ancient pagan religions. And amazingly enough, the Christian message caught fire in the hearts of the people in that area. And when the old missionary got wind of this, he wrote to the new guy and asked him, what is the secret of your power to get these people out of the depths of their sin? The missionary said, well, I suppose it's the power of Jesus Christ and the truth of his word. That straightforward approach worked very well 120 years ago in China, and I believe that it works today. God's message is real. Jesus is real. It's vital that people hear this message of the gospel, that they're lost in sin without faith in Christ. Their pride, our pride, can blind us to truth sometimes, but with the power of God, some faith on our part, God's ways can prevail. So let's keep proclaiming it to everybody who has ears to hear, even those who are convinced that they know better. Let's make sure that we have repented of all known sin in our heart of hearts in order to be used by the Holy Spirit. Let's not just go around pointing fingers at other people's sins, but let us confront the sin in our own hearts and minds, and let us receive the forgiveness that the death and resurrection of Jesus provides. Let's serve God with one another in the power of His Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.